Hi, I'm Jill Gostin, the IEEE Region 3 Director. This is one of several member-focused modules which give insight into the multitude of benefits and opportunities that IEEE offers beyond local activities. These include things like publications, IEEE to Kappa Nu, public policy, educational resources for members and their families, just to name a few. These recorded modules were initially offered live, but were also recorded to be able to reach as many of our members as possible. We will continue to build on what is offered here. If you have suggestions for additional content, please leave a request in the comments below. Welcome everyone. I'm glad you were able to call in tonight and I do know that um, some sections also advertise this as a section meeting so we're glad to have you here also. Um, you know, as you know, I have been trying to invite some different groups um, from the higher level IEEE units to present to us um, about what they do, especially related to sections and of relevance to our members. And tonight I'm excited to have our educational activities um, group represented here. We'll have Steve Phillips start out. He is a volunteer and is the vice president of educational activities, serves on the IEEE board. And Jamie Mosh, who is a member of the IEEE staff, the managing director of educational activities and Rachel Warnick. I'm not really sure of her entire title. She can introduce herself later. I think it has to do with governance and project management for um, educational activities. I got it. Okay, good. <laughs> Thank you. But um, I really appreciate all of them for being willing to be here with us tonight um, to give us pre this presentation. I'll also um, just want to let everybody know that they have also submitted an article for our newsletter, which should be coming out in the next week or so. Um, so be looking for that also. And um, I'll just go ahead now and turn it over to Steve and Jamie, whoever's going first. Thank you again. Okay, so uh, this is Steve Phillips. I think I'm going first. Uh, if we could have the first slide, um, the this slide is 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 not educational activities goals. This is IEEE goals for the next five years. And if you look at IEEE goals for the next five years, you can see that the big box in blue uh, has a lot to do with education, right? Educational service and resources to support lifelong learning and providing opportunities for career and professional development. Um, some of the others have uh, some educational content as well, but those are the, the, the big ones. And EA pay, plays a, a big part in that role. Um, but as you'll see on the next slide, I think, um, we do not uh, act in a vacuum, right? Education uh, is all over IEEE and educational activities um, is a leader in this, but we work very closely with all of the operational units of IEEE uh, to provide education to our members. Um, so you can see standards, technical activities, publications, uh, member and geographic, and IEEE USA. Next slide, please. Next slide. So our um, sort of answer about how does learning work these days, it's, it's, it's no longer discrete pieces. It's kind of a journey through our entire career. And so we have this kind of circle of, you know, pre-university activities where IEEE tries to um, provide outreach and motivation for youngsters to understand what engineering is and what computing is. Um, we, of course, ha play heavily in the university space. Um, uh, young professionals are an important part of the engagement with educational activities. Uh, you know, this progresses to mid-career and um, um, late in career professionals. And even our retri retired folks uh, provide uh, input to, to this educational journey. Next slide, please. And so our educational activities are focused really, we divide it into three areas, um, pre-university activities. So this is our tri-engineering uh, summer camps, uh, teacher volunteer training, summer institutes, tri-engineering together, um, really a clearinghouse for all kinds of outreach to K-12 students. Uh, at the university level, um, we do, uh, Coordination on ABET accreditation, uh, EPICS and IEEE, IEEE ADA Kappa Nu. We partner with the Education Society to provide resources to faculty and to students. 
And then in continuing education, um, this is a little bit more focused towards industry members in, in their careers, uh, e-learning certificates program and the IEEE learning networks. Next slide, please. Um, our focus is to try to uh, increase member value. Um, so in educational activities, the IEEE learning network provides uh, a simplified interface for for students, these being uh, career professionals, students who want to learn more, um, course discovery so you can find the content. IEEE has a lot of learning content, but it's spread out all over the place. And the IEEE Learning Network is a, a central hub to provide access to that. It also has provided significant improvements uh, to the course program quality. So we actually have a learning management system now, and uh, we are, uh, curating and producing high quality content. Uh, the certificates program does uh, continuing education units and professional development hours. And then uh, micro volunteering provides opportunities for our members to volunteer and provide outreach in STEM. Next slide, please. So I think uh, Jamie's going to talk a little bit more in detail about the IEEE Learning Network. I think you're muted, Jamie. This will be much more effective. Um, I have my many Region 3 friends. It's been a long time since I've down been down to uh, Region 3 and the student competition and things like that. Uh, it's definitely unique gear. So uh, I used to be in the MGA organization and joined educational activities uh, about four years ago. Um, and one of the things we said is we, we, we can't have education all over the place. It's, it's okay that it's there, but we really need to create a central hub. So I remember back when I was in membership, we said one of the most important things in education is to give people the ability to find our continuing education from across IEEE in one place. And so last July, we launched the IEEE Learning Network. And so you've got a combination of content that's there that people can take, but also about 500 courses uh, that people can find on the IEEE Learning Network, but it'll send them off to the Computer Society or the Communication Society or the Power and Energy Society, uh, et cetera, to take them. Other courses they can take in the Learning Network. One of the uh, volunteers years ago, uh, Sorrel Reisman, used to say, we need an explore, for, an IEEE explore for education. And so that's what the IEEE Learning Network is. Uh, we had about 70,000 people log on over the first 12 months. Uh, a lot of young professionals uh, and students log on. Uh, it's definitely... Uh, a disproportionate number of young professionals logging on. We've got over 900 courses available. Um, and what I think is the most exciting thing is the right-hand slide, right hand side of this slide. Uh, we have over 30 units across the IEEE uh, putting courses out there. And what might be interesting to you from a section level is uh, you may have content that's in an e-learning format that you want people to be aware of, like the IEEE Boston section, and you can list that and make it available on the IEEE Learning Network for members. Um, if, I, if my uh, memory serves me correctly, we had a uh, Region 3 had a lot of course purchases last year. Uh, over the 12 months, I think there are about 370 course purchases by members uh, from ILN, and that's just the educational activities content. They're also using all that society content and linking off to that. We're, we're outfitting the uh, ILN with the ability to, to track that, but right now we don't have it. So just e, IEEE e-learning courses from educational activities, there were about 370 purchased by uh, Region 3 members last year. Uh, that number is well more than uh, 2x, uh, actually almost 3x what it used to be in the past. So uh, we think IEEE Learning Network, the IEEE Learning Network is starting to add some value, and I believe it's just starting to gain some momentum. So we're really excited about this. Uh, if you don't know about it, check it out uh, at iln.ieee.org. Next slide, Bill. Um, just some features on ILN. You've got uh, you know things like content highlights. You can see what's going on. People can find out what's new if you go to iln.ieee.org. Uh, you, you, have, you have transcripts of the courses you've taken. You can get certificates from the courses and access them and print them out. Next slide. Uh, you in in a course, uh, you know, one of the th ways, one of the course things we used to have is like you had to watch a whole course, 
And now you have the ability in for the courses that are in the IEEE Learning Network, not the ones hosted outside, but those hosted in the IEEE Learning Network, there's kind of a table of content so people can jump to specific content that they're looking to learn. We know that's going to add a lot of value. Uh, some courses are almost an hour in length, so sometimes people want to jump right to things. Other times they want to go through the full course, so you've got those options to kind of pull it, you know, set it into micro learning bites if you want, or re or watch the whole uh, video end to end. Uh, we also, as Steve said, significantly improved our course program quality. We have professional instructional designers uh, building the courses now, so it's not just uh, a voiceover PowerPoint in Camtasia. There's actually professional instructional design on the slides, graphics, etc. Next slide. Um, as I mentioned, you have tra transcripts and certificates. So next slide. I uh, preempted myself on that one. Uh, next slide. Uh, great. And um, so that, that's ILN in a nutshell. Again, ILN.ieee.org will allow you to check it out. Uh, the other thing that we are very excited about, this is something that's really new for educational activities. We didn't used to do a lot of live events, but because of the whole COVID-19 situation, we, we saw a really unique opportunity to serve members and the community, uh, the, you know, the IEEE community in general in a significant way. And we're very excited uh, about the take rates on, on the activities. I mean, many of our webinars, you know, these are virtual events we're calling them, but essentially they're, you know, typically 45 minute, an hour and a half webinars with Q&A professionals uh, conducting them. Often there's over a thousand people attending some of these events and you can see we have things, you know, presentations on different technologies. We have presentations on how to teach virtually, right? Distance learning. Uh, the Ada Kappa Nu uh, program has pro, uh, event act activities to uh, engage students with um, potential employers. Uh, Try engineering. We have events for teachers and volunteers who want to do outreach in their community. Uh, you can learn more about those and all of these uh, webinars are accessible on demand for free. Uh, if you check that one little bit link, link uh, you can you can check that out. But uh, there's significant value to members. A lot of them are being accessed on demand. And then the next slide is going to show something that we're really proud of. Uh, and that is the very, oh, I'm sorry, I guess we might have skipped. Here we go. The remote instruction event. Uh, this was a week long event a couple of weeks ago. Um, it's all available on demand. Uh, but you can see the attendance rates. Again, I mentioned uh, live attendance was over a thousand people for some of these events. Many of the, uh, you know, a few folks on the call, Steve, uh, among uh, others, presented. You know, Steve's at the universe. Um, uh, sorry, not University of Arizona. Steve ASU. I, I almost said sacrilege. Um, he's at Arizona State University. Steve talked about labs and remote learning. Uh, but the other impressive thing is the amount of registrations and the number of uh, folks accessing these. Uh, courses on demand. So we're pretty excited about this. We believe this is a market that uh, that we can uh, serve well. Uh, it's something that we haven't done a lot. We partner with the Education Society and the IEEE Foundation to offer it. It's again all all free to members. Uh, as many of you know, IEEE has a lot of academics in our membership, um, and and we saw an opportunity during COVID to really help that community, and we're pretty excited. Uh, for those of you who are professors or are in sections. Uh, who have professors that may be looking to get up to speed, I'd strongly recommend checking out some of these topics. And uh, they're all uh, in about, Steve, what are they, about one hour uh, total uh, each each event? You're on mute. But I think I read your lips. I think you said, yes, about one hour. Yes, e each one's an hour and there were six of them. Great, okay. Um, okay, so uh, next slide. And uh, as I mentioned in the IEEE Learning Network, we're, we are cr creating better content. We used to create a lot of 40 minute courses just on one subject, but what we learned from our members, member surveys, and actually some best practices in education is we really need to do sets of courses. So now we create about four course programs per year. We always partner if it's in a technology area with another IEEE unit. But a course program is five to 10 courses in a subject. So, you know, we might uh, be teaching enterprise, enterprise blockchain, but that might be spread across, across six courses. Automotive cybersecurity might be across eight courses. And what it does is it allows us to give much more robust uh, teaching on the subject uh, to members. And the other thing that we're doing is we're not just creating courses because people have money available at the end of the year, which is what used to happen. 
Uh, we try to do a market research now. We work with the sales team, we go to customers, we survey members, and we say, what are the types of things that you're looking to learn about? Things like AI and machine intelligence, uh, 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 automotive, you know, cybersecurity with all that's happening uh, with vehicles and uh, the Vehicular Technology Society partnered with us on some of this. Um, you know, we, we, we're, we're doing these things about topics that members want to hear about. So we're pretty excited that IEEE Learning Network puts things in one place and we're putting more courses out that are higher quality in the areas that members are looking for. So this is uh, exciting things happen in educational activities when it comes to continuing education. Next slide. Uh, Steve mentioned the certificates program. We work with many of you in the local sections to administer the IEEE certificates program. Uh, we have Florida and New York, uh, you know, we, we're registered with Florida and New York, so those who are PEs can get credit for this. Uh, there is a modest charge uh, for certificates. You can buy them in bulk, uh, but we, admit, we manage it. We have a, a staff person who manages this. Uh, when there's any kind of audits from New York or Florida or any place like that, they handle the audit process. We track people. Uh, we have uh, the records of people who, who took what. Uh, there's a process for the courses to get vetted, et cetera but it allows you to add value to your events. I know some sections charge a little bit more, for example, to members who uh, want a CEU, they'll offer it for free if they don't want a CEU, and maybe $20 uh, if you want a CEU, those types of things. Uh, but most of that happens uh, in the, uh, most of the uh, certificate administration gets managed out of IEEE educational activities. Next slide. And Jill. Um, I'm going to hand it back to Steve because this is something exciting that Jill and Steve and many other board members are are, uh, are interested in. Jill, just a quick question. Did you want to do some questions in between or do you want us to push through uh, um, to the answer? Whichever end, you, did, whichever would, now, you now prefer. Now would be a logical time to answer questions if you wanted us to stop for a bit. Right, That's so fine. Whichever you prefer, whatever is easiest. You guys will... Um... Bear with me just a moment. I need to figure out how to find the questions. I have two people that have asked questions, and I can't seem to bring the window with the questions up. Uh, if if you ho hover uh, over your thing, there should be a little bar that comes up with Q and A. You might have to hit chat and then the Q and A bar. I could answer. I, I see uh, Charles Lord uh, answered that he could hear us, and I think that was early on. <laughs> and then the second question, David Fillion. Uh, said he participated in the reimagining education webinars uh, and did all six of them. Felt like they were excellent. Uh, he remembered Steve from the series um, and probably remembered he's from Arizona State and not University of Arizona. <laughs> um, and uh, um, thank you very much. He, you know, he commends us on on the on the response to education. So, um, Charles, uh, J Bill, if you're okay, uh, you know, while you're juggling it, uh, I'm happy to keep the questions going uh, until you can pull that. It's up to you. I'm fine with you doing that, um, uh, uh, Jamie, and I just uh, elevated Charles to help help with that as well. But uh, since you're you know how to do this well, um, I invite you to go ahead and interrupt whoever's speaking and let them uh, uh, field a question or two. Okay, no problem. Yeah. Jill, uh, back to you. Did you want to open it up for questions now for a bit before Steve uh, kind of shifts gears into the exciting lifelong learning academies? Um, sure. If anybody, any attendees have questions, I don't know if are they all muted, Bill? Do they have to submit their questions By, via right the Q and A? Um, so, if anyone will raise their hand or submit a question in the Q and A box, uh, Jamie or Charles um, will, will look out for that. And because um, Charles is now elevated, yeah. And I have the chat window open too. If people can't find the Q and A, they can put a question in okay, the chat. That, that sounds great. Good. I, I don't so, see any more right now. Yeah, so Steve, I'm a panelist. I don't know if I can raise my hand, but I'll just go ahead and ask my question. Sure. <laughs> um, so I wanted to go back to um, the, t the talk. I don't know who, which of you were talking about. It may have been Jamie about tryengineering.org. And um, I'd like to hear a little bit more about what the content is there and whether uh, you know, on the website and whether there has been any increase in usage and download of like the uh, lesson plans that are there now during COVID-19 from teachers or from parents. So, so we have a little piece coming up on, on uh, tryengineering.org. So okay. um, if Jamie can remember those questions, we'll answer them <laughs> when we get there. 
<laughs> yeah, so I, I could, uh, Steve, if you're okay, I can no, say that. You can actually, answer now, too. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I will say that it, the, the lesson plan downloads didn't actually increase, uh, as far as I know. I can check for sure. Um, I thought they might increase a little bit, too, but I think so many teachers are doing things virtually. They're just trying to figure out which way's up. Um, and a lot of our tri engineering lesson plans are hands on. Um, we're starting to try to put some more things out that are virtual. Um, and, and, and some of the, the um, tri engineering hands on talks, we're talking about that. But I think um, we, we didn't see as much of an increase as I had kind of thought might happen. Uh, but we will talk about tri engineering so that everybody else has more context soon. Good question, though. Jill. Yeah, I actually wondered maybe if some parents were downloading some of those hands on lesson plans to use at home. Um, but okay, thanks. No so I see that and, Thomas uh, has, go, ahead. go ahead, Charles. There's another question in the in the Q and A about certificates, Jamie. Yep, it looks like Tam Seal said uh, yes. Filling out the application, um, it could be for CEUs, PDHs, or participation certificates. Uh, we can do all three. Uh, and if you filled out the application, it'll go through with the process. Uh, my email will be shown at the end. Um, but you can always follow up directly with me at j.mesh at ieee.org if anything gets gummed up in the works. But the system should work pretty well. I just talked to uh, the manager of it yesterday. She was in the office. Uh, and so things are, are working pretty smoothly with that. Okay, with that, Steve, why don't we hand it off to you to, to talk about the lifelong learning uh, ad hoc. Okay. <clears throat> so, um... Jill has been part of, of this group, uh, but this was, an, it was initiated um, by uh, President Toshio Fukuda and was the main topic of our retreat in January in uh, Fukuoka, Japan. So the entire board of directors and <clears throat> the WIE and young professionals chairs and the Japan Council chair participated. And what we're looking at is focusing on the educational needs of our members, in particular, technical professionals. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> um, so at the at the end of this, we received we we achieved consensus. This was a sort of day and a half activity. Um, the first piece was that we wanted to focus on the importance of continuing education for our members. The second piece was we recognize that we need a shared organizational vision and plan. It's not going to be done uh, by just one of the OUs because education pervades all of IEEE. And um, we felt that the internal collaboration was going to be really important for delivering uh, the right content in this context. Next slide, please. And this is our ad hoc, um, so you can see the folks on there. So the co-chairs are myself as VP of EA, Kazuhiro is uh, VP of TAB, and uh, Rabab is, uh, I don't know what her board position is exactly, but she's on the board. Um, and uh, the other members of the committee you can see there. Rabab's a division director. Division director, okay, so she comes from the TAB. Um, and uh, Jamie and then Mary Ward Callen, who's the managing director for TAB, are the main staff participants. Next slide, please. So this is the charter. Uh, expand the concept of a program focused on lifelong educational needs of our members and potential members. We'd like to grow our membership. Primary emphasis on industry practitioners. Uh, next slide, please. And we recognize that we already had some, some data about what our members were interested in. So this is some survey data from 2019. And you can see um, topics of interest there are things like artificial intelligence and Internet of Things. These are not terribly surprising. Um, but on the left side, we also see that most of the members are um, interested in things in their technical field of interest. They're not so much interested in soft skills and, and things outside their field of interest. So this guided our initial, our initial foray into this space. Next slide, please. 
And this is the process we put together. So the first thing we wanted to do was select target areas for our pilot program. And we selected three, artificial intelligence, Internet of Things, and Smart Grid. Uh, we are now in the stage of curating and assembling existing content in those three areas. And with that content, we're going to build a learner journey. You'll hear a, a few words about that more in, in a moment. Uh, once we have the learning learner journey and we build the entire course out, then we can launch and market these three prototypes, uh, analyze and measure the uh, member response, and then uh, look for, uh, you know, based on what we learned the first time we go around, uh, select some more areas for um, building courses. Next slide, please. So this is an example of a learner journey. It's it's not uh, uh, completely fleshed out necessarily, but you can see that it's a combination of existing content, right? We have some e-learning courses. Uh, Tab has a bunch of them as well. Um, we know that there are many conference tutorials and workshops uh, that are are already available. Um, there are certainly distinguished distinguished lectures. Uh, many of them have been recorded. And of course, we have all the things in IEEE Explore, all of our publications. Um, but really, to put it together in a course, we need to build some glue between these elements and also fill in whatever gaps are needed in order to make it a um, you know, sort of seamless experience for, for the learner so that they know what they will be achieving by the end and we give them a path to get there. Next slide, please. Um, well, somebody has to build this thing. So we put together an operational team structure. You can see it here. Um, there's a steering committee. Um, and then right in the middle in the green box, you can see an, an educator in chief. So this is a technical domain expert who's going to have the final responsibility for what does all the content in this course look like. We chose the name educator in chief because it sounds a little bit like editor in chief for a journal. And that's our intent. This is a high level um, um, coordination activity. And between below there, there are technical editors for the different subdomains, domains that need to be put together. On the sides, the longer bars are the staff support. So on the left, um, you see that there's some uh, educational activities, marketing staff support, uh, education um, uh, assistance. Um, you know, we have in educational activities um, uh, not the content experts, but we have the learning expertise. So we have instructional designers who know how to put together courses that um, have effective uh, uh, transmission of of knowledge to to the learner. And then there's there's uh, tab support as well, because we need the subject matter experts who who will uh, be the, you know, the, the, the voice and the face uh, behind the content that's going forward. Next slide, please. So we have identified the th three inaugural edu educators in chief for our, um, our initial foray. <clears throat> So you can see them here, Chang Yang Wang for Internet of Things, Peter Wong for Smart Grid, and Philip Xu for um, Artificial Intelligence. And these are folks that were selected by um, uh, the tab side. So it's, it's people who've been working with future directions or with uh, societies and councils in these three areas. Next slide, please. Um, this this was uh, another survey that we that we did this year to try to understand which areas uh, were of the most interest. And you can see that the three that we chose uh, rose pretty high in the uh, uh, levels of interest. Next slide. And then this was kind of interesting. We 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 learned we definitely learned something from this part of the survey. Um, so the first box, the blue one on the left, is the number who were doing this to improve their skills to seek a promotion at their current in employer. And the red one is to improve skills to seek employment at a different employer. 
Um, and those were quite low, <clears throat> which we didn't really expect, or at least I didn't expect. I thought a lot of people would be uh, learning to to uh, uh, look for new jobs or or improvement in their current job, but it turned out that was not the primary motivator for most of the respondents to the survey. And this survey went to industry-focused members. It didn't go to academic-focused members. Um, but you can see that the biggest one is to improve my skills for my own interests, not related to employment. So, um, and to the you know the green one is also quite quite high. Improve my skills in my current job. So people feel that they have gaps even in their current knowledge at their current job. Next slide, please. So this is, uh, it started, we, we have these three ac academies designed, the Academy, IEEE Academy on Smart Grid, the IEEE Academy on AI, and the IEEE Academy on IoT. Um, so they're off and running. Uh, they're at different levels of development. My guess is they won't all three come, come together at the same time. Um, there'll, there'll be somebody who will be first to the gates. And that might be my last slide. What's next, please? Yeah, I think so it's I'm going to to me to talk a little bit about student and academic pro, uh, um, programs that we have, and that'll get into things like tri engineering. Uh, there was one question earlier from Zavoda uh, Charles asking about the vetting content when an OU creates content. Um, for the most part, Sabota, the the if we are hosting content in ILN, it gets looked at a little bit uh, more closely. Um, not quite as much as robustly as uh, what Steve presented with the educator in chief, et cetera. That's going to happen for the academies. Um, but we do have a continuing education committee that reviews content, and there are typically folks from a technical capacity within the societies to vet the content. If it's discoverable in ILN, we really don't uh, we don't uh, dig at it too much. Uh, we we just let people um, we you know they have to say who the presenter is. They have to give us you know a little bit of detail about the course. They have to uh, you know tell what the subject is. But then it links off to their platform. So there's a little bit less vetting um, for content that's discovered on ILN but taken someplace else. For most of the content hosted in ILN, uh, there is a little bit. Uh, tighter vetting process. Uh, we do try to have everything sort of have a technical peer review, uh, different than obviously the publications, but we do we do work with the societies to make sure that whatever's getting put out is accurate technically, et cetera. So hopefully that answers that question. Um, so shifting gears, we're kind of going backwards. Steve talked about that progression from pre-university to university to uh, uh, continuing education. We'd spent a lot of time talking about continuing education now we're going to talk a little bit about the pre-university and university activities to let you know uh, some of what's been happening. So next slide, Bill. Um, and so um, many of you may be aware of tryengineering.org. If you're not, uh, it's IEEE's showcase site. Got started by uh, Moshe Cam and others, uh, I guess probably almost 15 years ago now. Uh, there's you know hundreds of thousands of downloads of lesson plans. Uh, it tryengineering.org is the main resource for pre-university education at IEEE. And one of the things that came up from Sections Congress a few years ago was creating a <coughs> toolkit uh, for student for members to do more outreach instead of just the lesson plan. And we looked into it and shipping actual kits gets extremely expensive, especially being a global organization. And we try to make most of the lesson plans available in Try Engineering. Uh, you know, accessible to, uh, you know, teachers that may not have the resources to do robots, and et cetera. So they are, you know, typically uh, of things that can use household supplies, pipe cleaners, tongue depressors, tape, glue, et cetera. Um, so we can, you know, keep it relatively low cost and people can generally access this stuff in their local dollar store or uh, some other method. But what we did in order to answer this kit is we took 15 of the lesson plans and built a much more robust set of tools for a volunteer to use. Um, if you go to tryengineering.org, you'll see a link to the volunteer toolkit uh, with that, you know, the picture in the top right corner. Um, it teaches you how to do outreach. It teaches you how to cover that lesson. It teaches you some of the details of, you know, if you're uh, covering a lesson in uh, some physical pro in physics property, it'll talk a little bit about how to teach that concept, et cetera. And they're all done with these draw shop videos, which are 
kind of fun to watch, a little bit more engaging than somebody just reading over a YouTube video. Um, so the idea is we, we, we're doing 15. Um, we're going to see how well those are received, and hopefully people will like those, use them a lot. And assuming that they do, we'll extend uh, more than 15. Uh, right now, there's about 150 lesson plans available in tryengineering.org uh, that, that teachers and uh, volunteers use to, do, use to do outreach in their community. So we're excited about the toolkit to add value to volunteers who are doing outreach. Next slide. Um, the next program we have, um, a lot of our young professionals are volunteering in this. We have limited slots for young professionals. But those of you who work at companies, this is pretty exciting. We've created a program with Cricket Media. Cricket Media is the student is, I'm sorry, the uh, children's magazine publisher. Uh, and they worked with us to create a program called Try Engineering Together. And what this is, is it allows someone who works at a company to mentor a student one on one. Just in the top right corner there, you can see uh, um, uh, one of the IEEE staff being a mentor. Uh, you know, you get a, you do pen pal letters, you read articles with a student, they share what they're doing, and you go back and forth throughout the term. Uh, it might be a semester, it might be a whole year, but you develop a one-on-one -on -one relationship with the kids. Why is this important? Because we know most kids are much more likely to follow engineering if they have someone that shows them the way, right? Many of you, you know, it was probably your parents or your grandparents or your aunts or uncles or a family friend was an engineer and it opened the door to engineering to you. And so what this is, is it's an opportunity. A lot of these schools, most of these schools are all in um, lower income districts, you know, less advantaged. And so it's an opportunity for kids that might not have met an engineer to meet someone who's an engineer online, share it and open the world of engineering to them throughout a whole term. And you develop a relationship with the students over time. Um, again, it's a, it's a corporate offering. So the companies pay, there's no cost to the school at all. So the school doesn't pay anything. Uh, we actually have a waiting list of teachers interested in this. We need more and more companies to sign up. But on the next slide, I think I showcased just some of the companies that have been getting started with on the us on the Try Engineering Together platform. Western Digital, Northrop Grumman, Newport New Shipbuilding is a, uh, that's probably region two. Uh, I was thinking it would have been region three. Um, and Aerospace Corporation out in, out in California, Schneider Electric. Uh, as I mentioned, the IEEE staff is doing it and the young professionals. So uh, we're excited that this program is getting going. We'd like it to accelerate a little bit, but we're changing lives of thousands of students who are, are uh, who have taken part in this program over the last few years. Uh, it might still be in the hundreds, but uh, but each class is about 25 students doing one on one. Uh, Northrop Grumman, for example, sponsored five classes. IEEE did two classes. Newport New Shipbuildings does a few, et cetera. Um, next slide. Uh, and then we're we're also very excited. Um, we did a survey, actually, IEEE Risk and Compliance did a survey of IEEE volunteers to, and asked how many activities that they do that outreach to students. And they found that over 3,000 events are happening a year where students, are, are, IEEE members are working with minors or working with pre-university students. And that is awesome. Um, you know, we all know that uh, you know, it's a way that young professionals want to get involved, even life members want to do outreach to students in their communities. But we've always been disjointed in our efforts. And that's that's not entirely bad. It's good that we're we allow entrepreneurial our people to be entrepreneurial and try new things and get going. But we are building a section of Try Engineering. We're going to call the IEEE Volunteer STEM Portal, where we can connect the volunteers doing that. Volunteers who do outreach can tell us about their programs. Um, they can find, you know, see best practices. They can find and meet other volunteers doing outreach uh, and activities. Uh, we'll have a little bit of, of a way to measure our met, our metrics and impact so that we could go out and get sponsors for our programs. Uh, we can develop, we, we, we envision this in a situation where people will be able to apply for grants uh, and will be able to do, uh, amb you know, uh, outreach in their communities. They'll become Tri Engineering Ambassadors. And so we're excited about this. Uh, we're going to be launching this early next year. The pilot launch will be in a few months. Um, if you're interested, if you want to go to the next slide here, you can reach out to Donna Schultz, who manages our pre-university programs. Um, if you know of programs happening, I know there are a lot of programs uh, doing outreach to schools in Region 3. If you want to get your program showcased when we launch, uh, you can reach out to Donna and uh, submit your program. We'll give more details on what to do. But again, the whole idea here is 
just give other IEEE volunteers the knowledge of what, what, other, what, what other people are doing so that people don't have to make it from scratch each time and we can support them in their pre-university outreach. I'm a big believer that IEEE volunteers are the secret sauce of IEEE. Uh, we are the envy of many associations because we have so many engaged volunteers. If we can support you better in STEM outreach, we're going to make more of a difference in the world. And so that's what the volunteer STEM portal is all about. Next slide, Bill. Um, and uh, Steve, I think you're going to talk a little bit about accreditation and Ada Kappa Nu uh, as before right. we uh, get into a general Q and A. Um, yeah. So uh, EA Educational Activities is the coordination uh, of IEEE's um, contribution to ABET. You know, ABET is the accreditation board for engineering and technology, uh, mainly in the U.S., but it now has global reach. And IEEE is a member society. There are about 50 member societies in ABET. IEEE has the most programs of any society. We oversee the accreditation of more than 800 um, programs in IEEE's fields of interest. Um, and there are more than 400 IEEE volunteers, um, program evaluators, accreditation committees, and so forth that are involved in the accreditation process. Next slide. Um, EPICS in IEEE, this is engineering projects in community service. Uh, this is mainly a university level activity, although there is some uh, a smaller uh, K-12 effort. Um, but this provides uh, students with an ability to work on projects that provide uh, service to the community. Uh, and this, these are global, right? These are all around the world. Next slide, please. And IEEE Ada Kappa Nu. So this is our IEEE Honor, Student Honor Society. Uh, you can see uh, great pictures. We've got uh, folks around the world engaged in, in uh, Ada Kappa Nu. Scholarship, character, and attitude are the, are the motto. Next slide has a little more about Ada Kappa Nu. Um, if you know of a chapter at a university that doesn't seem to be very active, uh, Nancy Osten, whose contact uh, information is the, in the middle there, will be happy to engage with you to try to uh, resurrect uh, an existing chapter. Or if you know of a university that just doesn't have a chapter of Ada Kappa Nu, she'd be more than pleased to help you uh, work with that university to get a chapter established. Um, and I don't know how many there are in Region 3, but there are a lot. <laughs> Next slide. Uh, and the EAB Awards Program, this is a, a, a program in all the areas of education of IEEE. Uh, I don't know how many awards we, we, we have, uh, but it's at least a dozen. We also have a few scholarships. Um, we're not right in the uh, nomination period right now, but if you know somebody who contributes to education, and it doesn't have to be formal education, it can be informal education, it can be a section. We have an award for section education. Uh, we have an award for society education, uh, so all different kinds of education. We have one for informal education, one for pre-university education. So if you know somebody, a volunteer who's doing an exceptional job at this, please keep them in mind for uh, an award from EA. Next slide, which may be... Um, well, this is just... Uh, a reminder that uh, EA doesn't live on an island. We engage with all the different parts of, of IEEE, uh, and uh, that's what we need to do our work. And I think we're going to hand off to Rachel here in a minute. Yes, so Rachel Warnick is a uh, senior staff in educational activities, uh, does most of our uh, governance engagement, and then also uh, project management. So Rachel? Hi, thank you, Steve. Hi, everybody. Um, today I'm going to talk a little bit about our Section Education Outreach Committee, and Jamie touched on the fact that the volunteers at IEEE are really so special and make everything that happens within EA possible. Um, in terms of supporting the Educational Activities Board, I also support this committee directly. And what this group aims to do is share all the activities and programs that Jamie and Steve have talked about coming out of educational activities with the education volunteers 
through IEEE, obviously getting into the sections, chapters, and the regions themselves. Um, and the idea behind it is that we could provide resources to those individuals to then reach into the different segments and really work to get information distributed to the IEEE members at those local levels. Next slide, please. Um, so here's the 2020 committee. Um, Sukhavati Arambas is the chair this year. Um, and some of you might notice some of the, some familiar faces, especially uh, representing Region 3, Mary Ellen, um, who serves as the Region Education Activities Chair. She had also served on the committee last year as the EA MGA, the Educational Activities Board representative from MGA. Um, so those are the individuals that help us, that staff not only drive the efforts for the committee and direction of some of the things I'll be sharing with you in a moment, but also help to disseminate some of the information about what's happening in EA um, to the sections. Next slide, please. One of the resources I'm, I'm hoping that you can all leverage is ea.ieee.org. It's actually the Educational Activities Volunteer website. It's open to all IEEE volunteers, but it's really resources that are relevant for education volunteers. So again, it's not that you have to be an educational activities volunteer, but if you're working with education in your section or your chapter, these are resources that can be shared. Again, um, within the website itself, I would encourage you to check out the programs tab. Um, it really provides a lot of information that Jamie and Steve covered already and also offers resources in terms of the direct website links, flyers that can be modified specific for your efforts, those sorts of things. So again, it really allows the education volunteer to find the programs that are gonna be most relevant to your constituents and to your audience and figure out how you can provide those details and some resources to pass the information along to them as well. Um, one of the things that's also listed on that page would include the Innovation at Work, uh, which houses a lot of those webinars that Jamie touched on. The website for that is actually innovationnetwork.ieee.org, but that links directly there. The Engineering Lesson Plan Toolkit, there's a little bit of a description there as well as the resources. And again, it really just takes, gives an opportunity for volunteers to see what information is most relevant and pass that information along. Next slide, please. Um, we are also leveraging Collabratech, IEEE Collabratech, with the Community of Practice for Educational Activities. And again, these are all efforts coming out of that SEOC group. Um, and the goal behind the Collabratech community is really to bring not only IEEE volunteers together, but STEM educators, and really anybody working in that education area, and develop a hub for discussion and resources um, to share best practices. So um, if you're on Collaboratech, check it out and join that community. And the next page, the next slide, please. Here we have the education volunteer manual. So again, it goes beyond just educational activities volunteers to any IEEE volunteer that is working in the ed education area. And it too is located on that ea.ieee.org website. Um, it's under resources, and again, it gives a little bit more information about the specific role of those section education outreach uh, committee members, as well as some resources. One of the things that the SEOC provided in May was an orientation for all education volunteers throughout IEEE, and they're looking to plan a second session. Some more information will be coming, and um, we'll work with the, the SEOC members to disseminate that information and figure out when that date will be and share those. But again, it was actually, there was a session held in May, so the recording is already available on the website if anybody wants to take a look at that there. And again, it's just a way that, you know, if you need any resources or staff support within educational activities, ea.ieee.org has that listing there. And then obviously with Mary Ellen uh, being a great resource and knowing so much about education, um, she could definitely connect you with the right EA staff to provide any information that you might need. And that's all I have today.
Thank you, Rachel. Is that your last slide overall in the in the deck? Yeah, exactly. Uh, Steve, I don't know if you want to wrap anything up, but essentially, yeah, so here's some ways in social media to connect to educational activities. Um, but yeah, that's the last slide. I mean, we've got some slides in the appendix with more detail based on questions that may come up. Um, but that's really all we had to cover. We really appreciate uh, the region T. Uh, sorry, region three team giving us this time. Uh, it's it's you know we we all work together to make the difference. Uh, Steve shared in a lot of the slides, and so. Uh, you giving us this time is great, and thanks so much for people working into their evening uh, uh, down in the southeastern part of the United States uh, on behalf of IEEE members. But we, we're now here for any questions. Steve, uh, I don't know if you want to have, say anything else before we, we open the Q&A. Uh, no, I think that was a good, that was a good wrap. Um, you know, uh, if you have the uh, IEEE app on your phone, uh, you, you can look, look for me on there and send me a note directly if you want to. Um, or work through the through the staff. Uh, we're we're happy to engage with anybody who has an interest in in education, even if it's in an area where we don't currently do something. We'd like to know about it so that we can link to your activity or help you build your activity. I have a quick question. I'll I'll use host prerogative since I have a mic. Um, the uh, my 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 attitude is, my uh, opinion is that. Um, People, if they understood everything that IEEE is and everything that IEEE does, and if they weren't simply thinking of IEEE as a provider of goods and services, um, um, they would uh, invest themselves in it a little bit more. And it, it's in that context that I, I want to ask this question: If if I'm a um, if I'm a volunteer and I want to ask you, um, you know, how, how does EA um, support IEEE. I mean, I, I saw you've got the pre-college stuff, you got the college stuff, you got the professional stuff. Um, you know, I, I so if IEEE is a is an is an entity that serves the member, that serves the profession, that serves the world, the global community. Um, in in you know, what is EA's role in all of that, and adding sort of the unseen value of uh, IEEE's presence in the profession. That's a big question. <laughs> so, um, you know, our 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 attitude in EA is we want to support all of the educational activity that we can that that already exists in IEEE, and you know we can help sort of coordinate. We can help get people in touch with the right folks. Uh, we have professionals who can help curate content. Um, we can build high quality content. Um, but we do it in partnership, uh, usually with uh, societies and councils, but also with standards and with some of the regional groups as well. Um, we, you know, we do have some direct responsibilities. So the accreditation piece clearly belongs to EA. Um, and uh the certificates program is managed by uh, ea we have the uh, authority to do that um but in terms of developing content and guiding um it's it, it's a true collaboration so i i don't know jamie you probably have some some more examples yeah no problem um i i get paid to do it so i kind of have the elevator pitch which i think is sort of what you were asking for bill is that is that you know Sure. Uh, yeah, I mean, so what, what I tell people is um, the IEEE Educational Activities Group is designed to support education of engineers throughout their life. The big thing that we do uh, for kids is we try to inspire them in to, to, to learn about engineering and see engineering as a potential career, and not just electrical engineering. Certainly, we, we take that or computer science, but engineering in general, right? We want to inspire kids, open their eyes to things. Um, at the university level, we have the Ada Kappa Nu program that recognizing the, recognizes the best and the brightest students in engineering. But we also, through our work with ABET and accreditation, ensure that the quality of, of engineering education at the university level is really happening at, at, at the level it needs to. Uh, we also have a program called EPICS, which allows kids to apply what they're learning in school to help their communities. And then last but not least, we have the continuing education program that supports volunteers and members throughout their lives as they need to learn about new technologies 
you know, sort of no matter where it happens in their life. So that's sort of the pitch. Um, and there's all kinds of different opportunities for volunteering and getting involved uh, as people do that. Was that was that sort of the the answer you were? I mean, that might not have been the answer you were looking for, but was it sort of in the general uh, gist of what you were hoping to hear? Yes, yes, it was. So I, I'm, as I said, I'm I'm kind of consider myself sort of an evangelist for trying to make people aware of what all IEEE does. Because when you're when you're involved, uh, when and when you see it, you go, oh, oh my goodness, I didn't know IEEE did all of that. And I see the EA stuff as as a very good example of that. Um, and believe it or not, uh, folks, that that question articulated was much clearer than the one that's still bouncing around in my head. So it doesn't get any better than that. <laughs> yeah, for what it's worth, Bill. I mean, I see Dave Green's on the line. Uh, he was the MGA treasurer back when I started with with uh, uh, MGA, probably twelve years ago now, or no, fourteen years ago. <coughs> um, no, twelve years, I guess. And that's always been a challenge, right? I mean, I triple is so broad and so diverse. It's almost like, you know, Bill Bill Ratcliffe, another Region Three um, veteran, you know, used to talk about this is your professional home, and it's like you got to welcome him into the lobby, but then we got to find out what they're looking for and and get them to that. And hopefully, things like the I triple Learning Network and Tri Engineering for people that are interested in those things, it, it it helps them find that a little easier than it used than it used to be. <coughs> That was all I had. Uh, um, those of you that are keep tracking questions, are there any more that popped up? Don't see any more. So I have a question about ABET. Um, I don't, and it may have said it on the slide, and I just didn't see it. Is there information about how to get involved in that, or you know what's required um, that somebody could easily find online? Yeah, there is. So in the uh, in the EA webpage, you'll find you'll find a link to the accreditation activities. Um, so our engagement with ABET comes in um, engineering programs, but also engineering technology programs. And so we manage all the program evaluators and the visits for um, you know electrical engineering, um, uh, communications, telecommunications, and computer engineering. The there are opportunities for uh, volunteers to get involved. We are especially interested in industry focused volunteers who might be interested in visiting uh, programs uh, this year. Of course, all the visits are virtual, but uh, normally they're, they're physical visits to programs. We have plenty of academic folks who want to be program evaluators and so um, it's uh, it's a little bit more difficult to, to to penetrate in if you're an academic, but if you come from the industry side, we're looking for people who want to be program evaluators and help improve the quality of education uh, in in ABET accredited programs. And how much time typically does that take? Um, so there's there's some training, but that's uh, kind of you can do when when you want. But the visits themselves. Uh, uh, typically are a, you arrive on Saturday, it's all day Sunday, Monday, and then, um, you know, Tuesday evening you come back. So you, you need to have an employment arrangement that will allow you to take a couple of days off to do a visit once a year to stay engaged. Um, and most of the other parts you can do, um, you know, not during your scheduled work time. And Jill, uh, I just in the chat to everyone, actually, I might have sent it to all panelists. I should send it to all attendees. Uh, I just put a link uh, to the PEV. Uh, anybody who would be interested in being a program evaluator, uh, it summarizes the opportunities and the process, et cetera, et cetera. So I'll, uh, I'll send that, I'll put that in the link to the all attendees. Okay. Anybody have any other questions? I'm not seeing any hands raised. Um, I will remind everybody that um, we have recorded this and uh, we will get it on our YouTube channel. Uh, Bill, do you have an uh, estimate of how long it will be before it's available? So um, hopefully I can get to it this weekend. Should be there out there first early next week. Okay, great. So we'll make sure we let everybody know where it is so they can go find it.
Any so final questions? I, I just want to say that I thought this was a great presentation and thank the three of you and the fact that I dropped on mic, you probably heard that. Wasn't necessarily to say it was that good, but it was that good. So thank you. Very much. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I'll echo that. Thanks all of you um, for being willing to give this presentation and to write your article for our newsletter. Um, I'll remind everybody, you mentioned it in one of the slides that Mary Ellen is one of our Region 3 reps that serves on EA um, in, in some capacity, at least on that sections committee. I think she may serve something else also, but um, yeah. really appreciate all of, all of you taking the time out of your evenings to come and talk to us and also the attendees. I appreciate you being willing to come and listen and I hope that you will, um, once you get the information about the recorded video, I hope you will point some of the people in your sections to see it also because I think there's a lot of information here that people may not be aware of yet and I'd like to get that word out. So any final comments from any of our presenters? All right. Thanks for having us. Yeah. Yeah. Again, exactly. Thank you very much for, for having us, folks. Okay, night, thanks everyone. a lot. Everybody have a good evening. Thanks, everyone. Yep, good night.